Good morning. <laughs> when I read the background paper, you had a meeting in UK. Yes. Uh, I felt like I'm really coming to a group that's been working and thinking along the same lines as we have been doing, and therefore uh, I didn't know where we would be starting. I felt like I'm invited into the middle of a discussion that's been going on for a long time, along very similar lines to what we have been doing, and therefore I didn't want to have a PowerPoint that's going to start with step one and go from there. Uh, so I decided to leave it a little open. After listening to the first two speakers, that was more than fully confirmed, <laughs> because I agreed with fundamentally every, fu every main point that was made by them from different perspectives. And so I'm asking myself, how can I use this time to address, I'm not going to invent new issues, but to approach it from a slightly different angle to tell you where we are coming from. And when I say we, are, I'm referring to the work of the World Academy of Art and Science and the World University Consortium, which is a, uh, a younger organization created by the Academy about four years ago. The World Academy was founded in 1960 by very eminent intellectuals whose names you would know who were particularly concerned with addressing global social problems. We're not a traditional academy. We're not organized on a disciplinary basis. We're not focusing on disciplinary issues. We're focusing on global social issues, uh, as the, the, the speakers have been, uh, both Heather and Igor have been referring to. And our approach and work on education as an institution is we are asking ourselves, not from the point of view of the university, though it's a very valid point of view, but from the point of view of the world, what more or different do we need from universities and education in general in order to meet our needs? And just so I don't forget it, because it, I would probably be the last point if I'm still conscious at that point. Uh, but I thought the discussion about the common good was very interesting uh, because it raised a question in my mind as well. And I'd like to give my answer to that is that the common good for humanity in future is a highly individualized common good. And by individualized, I don't mean individualism of every man or every person from himself. We have plenty of that now. But I mean the common good comes from a much greater development of our individuality and our uniqueness. And there's no way we can do that without uh, radical changes in our educational system, which is really organized today to produce a common good of custom, of standardized output of, of people not very individualized to meet particular social needs or job requirements or technical requirements. So I think that's a very interesting question that makes us ask, what is the common good? What do we need for the future? And that's one of the key issues that the Academy is concerned with. We do, we are, whether we call them problems or challenges or opportunities, they are at an unprecedented level today. Uh, and we all know them, whether they're political or economic or ecological or social or cultural. Uh, at the same time, and we have to credit, I do credit, that the great achievements of humanity over the last few centuries are largely the result of the evolution and development of this unique social institution which we call education. Uh, if we want to start back historically, we might say that the first really effective social organization was language, communication, and then family units and so uh, different size units, and then markets, which enabled us to diversify, uh, and now we have the internet, which is the first global social institution, but education is really unique among our social institutions because it's the institution by which we try to take all the cumulative experience, all the learnings of the past from different civilizations and different ages, and pass on the essence of that. The essence of that which we might call 
wisdom or knowledge, whatever it is, or values, to the future generation so we don't start off and have to repeat all of the problems and mistakes of the past, which we do in any case in spite of the education. But as an institution, it might be fair to say that education is almost as young as the internet. I think it's, a, it's, it's the most complex effort that we have, that I can think of, of human beings to really draw on not only our intellectual, our scientific, but our emotional and physical experience, codify it, organize it, and find out what is really relevant to the future, and how do we pass it on. So, to begin with, we have a great challenge. The great, and, and all those who are involved in education are, are selecting, I think, one of the greatest challenges uh, that, that anyone can do. And it's no doubt, it's no surprising uh, if we feel there's room for improvement or even for radical change. And that's aggravated or increased by the fact that of, of where we are as a society, where society is evol evolving today. One, of course, the speed with which we're changing is uh, unprecedented in, the, uh, as, uh, in history. Second is the growing interactivity, interaction, not only between people and places, <coughs> but between centers and areas. Everything is connected with everything else today. So what worked before? The type of thinking that worked before, and very interesting comments about the need for different ways of thinking, are no longer as effective because of the growing complexity and interconnectedness of any, everything. And then because of these two, the increasing uncertainty. Increasing uncertainty, not because things are necessarily going down, but just because they're, we're not able to anticipate uh, that's Roberto's the theme, so I won't go there. We're not able to anticipate uh, what, where we will be in the future. If we look at education as an institution, and in particularly higher education, this has so many implications. I'm going to mention a few that we're working on just to make, bring it down from the abstract to the practical. But if we look at education as we're trying to give youth, we're trying to give the next generation uh, equip them to cope with this, then when we look at what we are doing in education today and what the needs of the next generation are, I think we can see there is an enormous need for change. Uh, enormous need. And there's <coughs> many reasons for that. One is simply that the knowledge of yesterday or even the knowledge of today in many cases is not very relevant to what youth will be needing or the, the next generation will be needing three to five years or ten years from now. And of course, we've got enough studies now by McKinsey and World Economic Forum to tell us that uh, uh, 50 to 80 percent of the jobs that uh, will be available 30 years from now don't even exist today. So how can we be educating people for those jobs? And that's only uh, one expression. And whatever the percentages, however valid they are, I think it points to a real challenge to educate. We've got another problem that the amount, and it was mentioned, I think, by Heather, the amount of information that we have today uh, is growing exponentially. You know, we started this process back, I think, 1077 at Bologna. <laughs> Uh, the idea of having people to come to a physical place, which we call a university, and listen to a wise man who could actually read. Not only could he actually read, but he had a book. <laughs> not, maybe not too many, but he had a book at the time when they were handwritten, three, four hundred years before the printing press. Uh, when books itself were scarce, no wonder we asked people to come to a place and listen to somebody who could read and had books and share their knowledge. Uh, a knowledge that was accumulated very slowly over centuries. And now, what is it? We've got, we can't keep track of the knowledge. We can't keep track of the knowledge even in our own fields. Uh, that knowledge that largely is available uh, uh, through other means like the internet today. And even if we, we could keep track of it, what are we going to give our students that's really going to help them prepare for the future? 
Obviously, what they learn, whatever we teach them today, is not going to be enough for them to go through their life. So more important than teaching them anything specific, we're going to have to teach them how to learn. And hopefully we're doing that. But we're going to, I think that has to be the, the primary goal. The primary goal is not to inoculate with a particular standardized knowledge that will equip them for a particular discipline but it will be to shift from the focus on the information, the focus even on the subject, to the focus on the person. How are we going to, how an education does this in some ways, in, to some extent, and differently in different places, but can we shift that focus so the real goal is the development of the human being? Not just of, uh, I'm a qualified as a medical doctor, by the way, one of our, my close associates uh, in our work, he's a psychologist, a Rogerian, who trains medical doctors who have gone through the whole medical education. This is in, mainly in Italy and other parts of Europe, and have never learned anything about the psychology of a patient because they've been so specialized in uh, learning about the physiology of the patient. Uh, as if, in spite of the fact that there's such superabundance of knowledge, uh, facts, research to show, that the cure has as much to do, in many cases, with the psychology of the patient and of the caregivers and rest of the family, and yet we're so focused on this narrow thing of the physiology or the anatomy uh, that we're not even equipping them for their specialized job. So uh, one of the things we conceive is a shift from information to, there was a mention of knowledge or wisdom. If we could define wisdom, uh, I think, I mean, in a really practical way that we could identify that would be helpful. Or a shift from information to values, because I'm, apart from what I'm doing here, I'm a business consultant, and I, and I find the most practical, valuable knowledge that I can communicate to uh, a, a corporation is the value of values uh, in their work. If they want sustained, effective work, if they want to uh, uh, keep people, if they want to satisfy customers, if they want to be in tune with the society. So values in some sense represent the essence or the quintessence of this collective wisdom we've acquired over such a long period of time. How do we teach values without being dogmatic, without going back to a theological uh, form? But I think we've gone to the other extreme today. We've so sanitized our education in such, in such an effort to separate uh, education from uh, the clergy and the history of education that we're afraid to talk about. Uh, the thing that is most essential to us, the thing that's most essential to human beings. And my background's in psychology, and I feel that we're, uh, we, uh, if you look at what we're teaching in psychology, and this is, was true 45 years ago when I studied it as it is today, uh, we're trying to reduce the human being to something we can measure, some statistics we have. Uh, we're trying to quantify everything to be good, natural, as, as uh, scientific as the natural scientist. When we're talking about a reality that's a hundred times more complex than the reality being studied by uh, particle physicists, and a lot of my good friends are particle physicists, and they agree with me. I, I went to CERN and gave a colloquium uh, and said what the, uh, the subject was, what the, the, the social scientists could learn from the natural scientists, because I wanted them to feel uh, that they are going to tell us you know, all that we should do differently. And I think that my goal was, and I think I succeeded in convincing them, is they're very happy that they have such a simple job. <laughs> because the quarks are all, except they've got several colors of them, they all behave the same, the blue quark or whatever color it is. Uh, uh, they're not conscious, they're not thinking, they don't have individual opinions, they don't change their mind. Uh, this is a much, we're trying, we're dealing with a reality that's so much more complex than uh, the reality of the natural sciences, and yet for 200 years we've been striving so hard to convert and convince everybody that we're as scientific as the natural scientists, which I think is to reduce the most 
the greatest wisdom we've acquired to reduce it to folly. Uh, and in psychology, I'm ashamed to say, that's a very, I hope not to uh, uh, have to, my colleagues uh, don't misunderstand, but I'm ashamed to say that we're competing to be biologists and neuroscientists as if neuroscience has actually explained human behavior or, menta or mentality or emotion and all of these things. Uh, and these are themes that we've been discussing in the academy. Uh, a shift in focus. When the academy started, uh, it was, I think, uh, look, according to Igor's trend, I think we were at somewhere between multidisciplinarity. We recognized that whether we're physicists or economists or lawyers or artists or musicians, that there are multiple valid perspectives about reality. Uh, and that instead of bringing the disciplines together, we bring individuals together who will explore problems from a multidisciplinary perspective. Maybe they didn't call it that, but I think that was the intention. But today, we think that's not enough. Uh, it's not enough that we come in with different hats and we respect each other and listen politely to each other, but still from a disciplinary uh, perspective. Uh, if you look at uh, medicine, I studied medicine for a year before I dropped out. Uh, listen, you look at how we're, we learn physiology and anatomy. Uh, we're taught about the digestive system, the respiratory system, circulatory system, lymphatic system, uh, nervous system, and all of these things. Go into the body and you find out very soon they don't exist. They're absolute abstractions. There is no circulatory system independent of all of these others. It's not that they're pieces put together like a machine. We've got a carburetor and a, a radiator and a, 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 an engine and a fuel tank and everything. It's not like that. You can't put these things together. They are organically grown out of each other. They're inseparable from each other. I am a co-chair of an international group. One of the activities of the academy were uh, looking for new economic theory. And half the, we have 50 people in the group from around the world. I think less than half of them, maybe a third of them, are economists. We've got people we've got, uh, from law, uh, from political science. We have uh, people from education. We have people from all areas because we're not trying to reconstruct the narrow discipline of economics. We're trying to look at how it, economics is in, inextricably linked with everything else in the society. And the further we go, the more difficult we find this abstraction, the abstractions about economics to be. But I'm just going to mention one point more as a provocation than an explanation. Uh, one of the projects we're working on now is, uh, can we say, it's a hypothesis, that the, the problems we're having with the deterioration of democracy in the world, in my own country, the US, uh, and we see it in other places, I don't have to mention names today, is directly result not just of political factors in the way economies working, uh, of the, the pol politics are working, democracy is working, it's a direct result of economics and economic theory. When some of the leading proponents of neoliberalism established the Mount Pelerin Society in 1947, they did it in Europe. They came out of Austria. They did it because they were really concerned about the impact of authoritarian governments on human freedom. And so they said, look, if we can separate out government from economy, we'll at least preserve a key aspect of human freedom for, for the individual. He can own his property, he can freely do things, and if we have a free market, uh, then uh, he's, he'll be safe from the worst uh, attacks of totalitarianism. But today we've got a complete inversion. We've got the complete unregulated market that undermining the freedom of people, and I won't go into it unless you want to discuss that later, uh, to the point where it's undermining democracy. 
And I think there's enough research to show that what's happening in the U.S. and other places where people are voting, the population is voting uh, uh, for the opposite, is because you can't separate these things. And Adam Smith knew it very well. He wasn't an economist. He was a moral philosopher. He wanted the common good in the best possible. He wanted the welfare and well-being of everybody. Just in whatever few minutes I have left, I just want to touch on a couple other themes uh, and questions would be welcome. Uh, this has impact not only on our organization of disciplines and our theoretical conceptions, it has two other, uh, two other important implications. One is on pedagogy. Uh, I think that we really need a complete shift from, and I think most of you, or maybe all of you, would agree with me, so uh, that makes it easier, but the idea that the student is there to passively receive knowledge uh, from somebody, to awaken the capacities and fully develop the capacities of the student to acquire not just the knowledge we think they should have, but the knowledge that they want. There's a recent report from Stanford University that they talk about in, 20, in another 10 years, the university should not be organized by departments where a student comes in and follows a discipline from beginning to end. They should be centers of competency where students can choose the knowledge or experience that they want from many different centers and put together their own uh, uh, their own education, assemble the, that's interesting to them instead of we're standardizing everybody to fit into groups. And I remember now, uh, Roberto, at one, well, maybe it was at the Baku conference, uh, I remember your comment there saying that uh, we're training more and more and more specialists and nobody's a generalist today at a time when we need, all of us need to know much more generally than before. And then I'm just going to uh, uh, close just because of the time here by going back. Both of the speakers have mentioned a theme which I consider very, very important. And that is the ways of knowing and the ways of thinking. And just very briefly, we have been for the last 500 years developing with a vengeance one mental faculty which we call analysis. The capacity to divide reality into smaller and smaller parts, zoom in, magnify it like a microscope, and discover that even this small thing is a universe, and get lost in it, to the extent that the more knowledge we have of the part, the more we're losing the knowledge of the whole and the interconnectedness. And interconnectedness is the reality. Everything else is only an abstraction. Uh, there's nothing separate from anything else. So there's been reference already by our speakers about the need for a synthesis, for a greater synthetic thinking. And you, you might say that over the last 50, 70 years, the development of systems thinking arose out of this recognition that the uh, analytic thinking was not enough. Let's try to put everything together and connect everything. And I think that's a necessary and valuable step forward which has helped us a lot in many fields. But I don't think it's enough. I think that even our systems thinking today, by and large, generalization, is very mechanistic. It's very shallow. It doesn't go to the depth of the fact, that, and I'm particularly thinking in the social sciences, uh, that uh, we are conscious human beings, and everything we do depends on not just the physical circumstances, not just our links in a network, but our perceptions, our emotions, our attitudes, our values. And there's very little of that that I find coming out in the systems thinking. So I, we are talking about another shift, and it, it's only words, but I think you'll understand what I mean, to something much more integrated where we recognize that the reality is integrated, it's not just interconnected, that everything is connected with everything else. How are we going to study that? How are we going to study it uh, separately, or how are we going to study it even in relationship? It requires a different type of perception, a different type of thinking. Not that we reject all analysis, not that we reject all 
uh, synthesis or connection or holistic thinking, but we also consciously develop uh, non-linear perceptions and, and capacities. Uh, with that, I just stopped.